I call to order the April 24, 2023 special meeting of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to our second meeting in the West Committee Room. A reminder to everyone that the room has room-wide microphones. They allow any speaker to be heard both in the room and on the live stream. As such, please take care with side conversations. The Zoom audio feed will pick up all audio from the room. I would like to note that Regent Tad Johnson is attending via Zoom. Good afternoon, Regent Tad Johnson. The first item on the agenda is the real estate transaction. This is the lease of 176 North Mississippi River Boulevard, uh, familiar, familiarly known to us as East Cliff. This is on the agenda for review and action. Senior Vice President Franz, will you walk us through the proposed lease? Good afternoon, Madam Chair, and thank you. My name is Myron Franz, Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations. Good afternoon to all members. I'm happy to be here today and talk to with you about a proposal that would lease the university property located at 176 North Mississippi River Boulevard in St. Paul as East Cliff, to the state of Minnesota for use as a temporary residence for the governor and the first lady once the property is vacated by President Gable. As you know, the property known as East Cliff has been an, an integral part of the university community for over six decades. East Cliff was donated to the university in 1958 by the Brooks family and has served as a residence for eight University of Minnesota presidents since 1961. With President Gable's departure and the state of Minnesota's need for temporary housing for Governor Walls, the First Lady, and their family, we have an opportunity to put this publicly owned asset to good use during a time of transition. As far as I can tell from the records and our collective memories, this will be the first time that we will have a Governor and First Lady in residence at East Cliff. By leasing East Cliff to the state of Minnesota, we can ensure that this historic property continues to serve a public purpose and supports the university's mission of community engagement and outreach. The key terms of the lease are the rental period of about 15 months. Unless the parties mutually agree to different dates, the lease for the premises is anticipated to be July 1, 2023, or as soon as practical thereafter, and continue through September 30, 2024, with three one-month options for renewal available to the state. Rent will be $4,400 per month based on recovering the cost to the University of the East Cliff uh, House, with the state responsible for direct cost of utilities, snow removal, lawn care, cable, telephone, custodial, and security systems. The rent will be used by university facilities management to cover estimated minimal maintenance and reduced operating costs associated with the use of the property by the state for this 15-month period. No capital costs are associated with the rent. The U is partnering with the state in order for the U to recover its costs and also to support the opportunity for the state to save money in the residence or the temporary residence for the governor and first lady. I recommend approval of this agreement to lease Lease Cliff to the state of Minnesota as a temporary residence for the governor and first lady. This is an opportunity to serve the public interest support the university's mission, and foster positive relationships with our state partners. I want to give special thanks to the entire board of whom I've spoken with all of you in the last several days, and you've provided me with your views and, and issues regarding this, this proposed lease. Thank you for that, for those conversations. And I'm happy to answer any questions you all might have about this proposed lease, Madam Chair. Thank you. Before we turn to discussion, is there a motion to approve the proposed lease of East Cliff? So moved. Is there a second? <clears throat> second. We have a second. Thank you. Any discussion? Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Senior Vice President. Um, I, I think it's an excellent idea. I mean, it allows us to obviously um, recoup some operating costs as well as uh, Put a public asset to, to public use and continue to serve the state in that way. Two uh, quick questions. 
Um, I know there's the East Cliff Advisory Committee. I'm not sure of the, the membership of it. Um, again, this this thing developed quickly, so I understand if they weren't able to opine on this, but I'm curious if they were. And then my second one, uh, are we confident in our ability to fulfill that July 1 start date, um, considering um, East Cliff has a current tenant? <laughs> Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. So yes, on the in terms of the target date of, of, of July 1, we feel confident that will work. You know, we have both move out and move in issues, both in terms of the governor, the, the state getting it ready for the, for the governor's uh, residence and also for for leaving. So we, we think that'll work, but there's still a few loose ends to tie up to get that finalized. Uh, but I think the other thing that we're really uh, optimistic about is that this this use really provides us with an opportunity to keep the prop, keep oversight of this property ongoing. We did um, a check with the uh, East Cliff Advisory Board, um, uh, uh, Region Davenport, and I have called. There's a few people we haven't called yet, uh, but the, we really wanted to make sure that people were aware of this, understood the concerns, uh, both in the in the in the donor community and in the Brooks family community. So we exercised great uh, caution and diligence. Thank you, Regent Davenport, to make sure that everyone knew about this that we could talk to. Thank you. I look forward to supporting the, the motion. Anything you wanted to add, Regent Davenport, or did Vice President Franz cover it? On Thank you, behalf? Chair. He covered it, and I would just say supportive comments. Okay. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, uh, Chair Miron. Um, Senior Vice President Franz, um, I've got a, a question and then and then a little commentary. Uh, the question is um, understanding how the, the potential extensions, so at, at the, the three month options, are those options for the state to exercise? I mean, how, how does that fit with our with our side of the of the equation? Just just thinking out as to other potential transitions. Madam Chair. Yes. Well, that was designed in part because, the, as you know, the reason for the governor's availability as a tenant is the uh, construction and renovation of the governor's residence. And so we just built that in for the caution that could be there if, in fact, it doesn't get done on time. So this is just one of those uh, safety valves. I mean, we'll know, we'll know leading up to that time in September, but we wanted to have that there just in case. Yes. Well, yeah, because I, well, I was thinking about that point and wondering, if, you know, we will have a lot of interesting conversations about the building and with the uh, the, the uh, oversight group because um, there's been some conversation about East Cliff going on now for you know a number of months, um, at years actually. But um, you know, I was wondering whether it made more sense to just go with a longer contract that we could then break or waive at some point, as opposed to be sitting there where we can't really answer the question of. When, when we're actually going to um, take it back for, the, you know, hopefully a permanent uh, president by then. Um, but, you know, I guess you'll have to navigate that when the time comes. I um, just a couple comments about about this opportunity. Um, as I explained to uh, senior uh, vice president Franz in a in a call, I had actually received a call a, a few weeks ago from retired state senator Jen Olson. And she had said, I don't understand why. You know the university doesn't uh, set this up with with the governor. I guess a couple weeks ago, and, and uh, uh, you know my, my understanding was that the agreement was already in place, and so it was a wonderful, wonderful surprise to to hear that this was a an opportunity for the university. I think it's you know it's a win win, um, and I think that it, uh, East Cliff is such an amazing resource. It's such a great asset, and I. I know um, having had a chance to see it under different presidents, and, and, and I, I don't think that you know, some members of the board now have had a chance to kind of see it in that in that context with the sit down. You know, I think certainly coming out of COVID and that had some impact on our use of it, but um, the relationship building opportunities that have come, that come from the dinners that that the university president um, has had in, in throughout history. It's really remarkable. I mean, we, we can have events at McNamara, we can have them in other places, but when people are invited to uh, to dine with the, the president and the president's family at East Cliff, it's a, it's a lifelong memory. And so it's something that I really hope um, we'll be able to put back into the into the, uh, the toolbox for the university, especially at a time when relations, you know, public relations are, are, uh, are critical. Um, I think having the governor stay there for a period of time just adds to the mystique of this amazing facility um, to be able to, to 
to reference the fact that this served as the governor's residence for a period, I think, is a really neat thing. So, um, you know, I, I, I send off the I send this off with uh, full support on a great opportunity for the state to to uh, to, to have two very important in, uh, institutions come together, the governorship and in the university. And, and, you know, with the hope that when we come out of this, that, that we have full commitment to, to seeking how, uh, to use that resource um, for the new president and, and time going forward for the university. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Any further comments or questions by my colleagues? All right. Thank you very much. There being no further discussion, it appears everybody's ready to vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. Thank you very much, Senior Vice President Franz. You get to make a really great call to the go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. It's very pleasing. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, the second item on the agenda is I want to provide an update on the process to select an interim president. This, uh, and that is as follows. Based on our discussion, an interim president position description and application Instructions were finalized over the weekend and a website went live earlier today. The university is now accepting applications at interim-pres-search.umn.edu. And we encourage anyone who's listening to share this information with anyone you think would be a strong candidate. And let me just say, if you didn't write that down, if you just go to the University of Minnesota Regents website, uh, you will see immediately, is my memory, because I did it a little bit earlier, a link that takes you right to the interim search. So the easiest way is just go to the Regents uh, website. In alignment with the board's desire for an accelerated process, the posting will remain open until Monday at noon. So this is this coming Monday, a week from today at 12 noon. After that time, applications will be compiled and shared with regents for review. We have held time on your calendars for a special board meeting this Friday morning to discuss applicants in a DIA identified way and to select finalists to be interviewed. Uh, and as you know, our general counsel's office will provide guidance on how to discuss candidates during that meeting. That meeting uh, will not take place at the special board meeting currently scheduled for April 28. It will occur after the close of the application process, uh, which is going to close next Monday. So we will be, Rachel will be uh, circulating calendars very shortly to you all to hopefully find a common date next week for us all to come together to discuss the, review the applications and to discuss the applicants in a DIA identified way so that we can select finalists to be interviewed. Assuming we are agreed to the finalists next week, I anticipating, anticipating them, I'm sorry, anticipate inviting them for interviews with full, the full board during the week after that, which I think would be the week of May 8th. Uh, so what this means is if our originally we're talking about having this all our interim president selected by, by May 5, because we are now allowing applications to come in until mo next Monday, a week from today uh, until noon, it does mean that we will be um, hopefully selecting our president during the following week by no later than May 12. That's that's the goal here. Finally, um, I want to acknowledge that the board continues to receive a wide variety of public comments on the topic. All comments are being compiled and shared with the board for our consideration. I want to reiterate that we are highly appreciative of each person who took the time to share their ideas and perspectives with us. Uh, I do know that when comments come into the board, the board office is sending out information to the, so if someone writes to the board and says, I think you ought to consider candidate ABC, there is a communication that is going out from the board office that now will tell them how to uh, get in contact with the, the link uh, on the website to submit applications. 
But if you receive phone calls from people, and I know I have or emails saying, have you thought of this person? Have you thought of that person? What I've been doing, and I assume you will do the same, is provide them with the same link so that they can go and submit that information vis-a-vis uh, -vis the applicant process. So that's how I've uh, kept up with people saying, here's a process and I hope your applicant or your suggestion applies. All right, any questions about the process or our next steps as a board as it relates to the interim selection process? Yes, Regent Farnsworth. Thanks, Chair Mayor. And I may have just missed this, but um, are we still using the Friday board meeting for something else or is that off the table now? I don't want to take it off the table yet because I want to see how today's meeting goes and I don't know if there's going to be any spillover where we couldn't complete things. So we'll make a decision as a group at the end of today's meeting, whether we need the April 28th date or not. Yes, Regent Verhaley. So <clears throat> Chair Mayor, and that feels like a comment of let's use our time efficiently and effectively today. So that would be good. Support staff <laughs> can get a couple hours off on Friday morning. <laughs> no problem. That, that would be good. Yep. All right, the next item on the agenda is the vice chair election. This is also for review and action. As noted in the docket materials, Article 3, Section E of the bylaws requires that notice is sent to each member of the board 10 days prior to the date of the meeting at which an election to fill a vacancy in an office of the board will be conducted. If the board agrees on the need to fill this vacancy now, we must suspend the 10-day notification provision of the bylaws. A vote to suspend any portion of the bylaws requires two-thirds of the entire board voting in favor of the motion. If the motion succeeds, we will then move to the election of a vice chair using the same process we did in December. If the motion fails, the election would be held at either a special meeting with notice provided 10 days in advance or the next regular meeting of the board, which is in May. Is there anyone willing to move the motion as stated in the docket materials? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. <clears throat> All right. Uh, then the uh, motion is as follows as set out in the materials. Be it resolved that the Board of Regents hereby suspends pursuant to Article 10 of the bylaws, the 10 calendar days notification requirement of Article 3, Section E of the bylaws. And we do have that second. This motion is not debatable, but if there are any questions on the process, I would be happy to provide an opportunity for my colleagues to ask them now. I, any questions, I, not, not debating, but questions. Yes, question. Regent Rocha. Has there, has there been a notice sent to start the 10-day process? Or? No. Okay. No, there has not. Any other questions on process? All right, there being no further questions, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Madam Chair, point of order. I think if you have to have a supermajority, it would have to be by roll call. Madam Chair, the, the bylaws do not require a roll call on it, but it's certainly the prerogative of members to ask. Well, I, don't, I don't know how you determine two thirds versus but whatever. I think I can listen and hear, and if I have a question as to whether it's two thirds, but if anybody wants a roll call, I'm happy to do a roll call on this. Okay. Anybody requesting a roll call vote? All right. Then we'll, we'll do this again. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please no. say no. 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 I'm sorry. So uh, let's do a roll call so I make sure that I am doing this accurately. Executive Director Steves. I thought they were, but now I heard too many. <laughs> At least three. <laughs> On the motion to suspend the bylaws, Regent Davenport. Aye. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Farnsworth. No. Regent Farnsworth votes no. Regent Hipsch. Yes. Regent Hipsch votes yes. Regent John Ruth Johnson. Yes. Regent Ruth Johnson votes yes. Regent Tad Johnson. No. Regent Tad Johnson votes no. Regent Kenyanya. No. Regent Kenyanya votes no. Regent Powell. Yes. Regent Powell votes yes. Regent Rosha. No. Regent Rocha votes no. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Regent Tayurabe. No. Regent Tayurabe votes no. Regent Verhalen. Yes. Regent Verhalen votes yes. Chair Mayron. Yes. Chair Mayron votes yes.
All right. The vote uh, was seven in favor, five against. The motion did not carry. So we will not take up the issue today of the vice chair. We will then notice it uh, for another uh, special meeting 10 days out, or it will be held at the next uh, meeting, which will be our May meeting. All right. Moving on yes, to the chair. next item. Yeah. Can, can we take a short recess? I'd like to consult with OBR staff briefly. All right. Um, we five minutes. Pardon? Five minutes. Uh, we will take a short recess. Thank you. All right.
right, we've had a short recess. Regent Verhaland, is there a motion you want to make? There is, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I would like to move that this board, under Article 10 of our bylaws, that this board suspend the bylaws from now until June 30th, 2023. Excuse me. Move to suspend the bylaws and create the position of co-vice chair from a period of today through June 30th, 2023. And I'd be happy to explain my reasoning if there's a second for that motion. Co-vice chair from now to 2020, June 30th, Do I have the latitude to let her explain it before we seek a second? Under Roberts. Yes, go ahead. Why don't you explain the rationale be given? I don't think anyone was aware of this. No. And no one may know why if they want to say a second it or not. Or uh, Madam Chair, to my knowledge, we have two individuals who are both very strong candidates for this position. And this is a limited period of time where these two candidates can work with you, Madam Chair, on leadership for this board, which currently we only have you as leadership for this board. And having additional support in that leadership role, I think is really important. This is for a very limited period of time. This would be through June 30th of this year. We can then vote for a permanent replacement after that, but it will give not only you, Madam Chair, an opportunity to have colleagues in leadership, but also this board the opportunity to have lead full leadership at this period of time when we have an outgoing president and an incoming interim. Thank you for the explanation. Is there a second to the motion? Okay. Can I ask a clarification? Is that allowed? Sure. <laughs> this this motion cannot be discussed either. Well, Madam Chair, to suspend the motion to suspend bylaws is a non-debatable motion. There can be questions for clarification. Can we move to debate? <laughs> okay. Is it? Can we? Uh, you know, it seems to me if people want to debate in this motion, is there a way that we can move to suspend Robert's rules of more order as to this so to allow a debate on it and discussion? I'm getting an affirmative from our the man of the rules. The answer is yes. Do we need a motion to do that, or can I, in all of my wisdom and power, of which is limited, uh, order that we? Uh, can debate on this. Madam Chair, it's, it's certainly up to the chair how you want to uh, okay. progress through the meeting and, Thank and you. if your colleagues are willing to uh, allow that. Put up with me? All right. Yeah, Madam Chair, if, I mean, it's the, the, well, ru first of all, the ruling of the chair and if nobody appeals the ruling of the chair, then it happens. I mean, correct. All right, well, what I'd like to do is get a second. If there's no second, I don't think we need to go any farther. I'd like to, I'm hoping there's a second to the motion. And then I will uh, allow debate on the motion to, to bet it more completely. Second. All right. So, uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, um, Chair Mayron. A question, Regent for Halen. It's your motion. This is the inner parliamentarian, former parliamentarian coming out. Is your motion to suspend the bylaws? And I, I want to make sure I heard your language precisely. A portion of it, I just heard suspend the bylaws generally. Suspend the bylaws as it relates to the position of vice chair. So just one section of yes. it. Or? Sec Article 3. Whatever it is. Okay. All right. Just as to that section. Thank yes, you. Regent Rocha. And so <clears throat> my understanding then would be that the position of vice chair is created through the bylaws. Is that accurate? So this is suspending that to create. Um, my technical question is in the, in the uh, unlikely absence of the chair, which of the vice chairs is vice chairer? Uh, which one would be would have you know which? How do we determine which vice chair would have precedence to step into the chair role if that's necessary? So under the bylaws, it is automatically the vice chair, and so if we are suspending to suspend vice chair and make it co vice chair for a period of time, then it could be co chairs, unless this board wanted to resuspend the rules and appoint resuspend the bylaws. And instead, state one is the chair and one remains vice chair. Other discussion? I, I will say that um, my preference as chair is to have co chairs as opposed to no vice chair. Co vice chairs as opposed to no vice chair between now and May. Um, that we have many, many important issues and having the ability to consult with others in this role is. Um, 
would be very desirable to me. And as um, Regent <coughs> Verhalen has noted, we have two excellent candidates and uh, I would welcome their input in this um, position until we are able to vote on the what's going to happen for the next two years. So just to share my own personal view on this. I believe we can clearly make this work with the two individuals. Yes. I mean, Madam Chair, it, it is a question of Regents Hipsch and Kenyanya whether they're will, willing to be co-vice chairs, obviously. But I'm assuming they do. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go out in the hall and discuss yeah, this? Or? Not I can't beat him in one-on-one -on -one in basketball. But. <laughs> I can't. You don't have a new hip. <laughs> Any further discussion on the motion? Regent Talrabi. Yes, me, Regent Talrabi. Uh, Chair Mayron, I, I guess just on that point, for me, it would be important to hear from the two people who are interested in the position because I feel like otherwise I'm, I would be guessing and making an appointment that might not be what, you know, what, <laughs> what feels right for the individuals. Um, so I, I don't I don't know how we proceed with that because I know we're debating the motion. But, but. Any thoughts? Uh, let me share my thoughts and then the experts on this. It seems to me we can vote on the motion. It's it, we're talking about two individuals in theory. Then those two individuals would be nominated for the co-vice chair position. And presumably, if either or both of them didn't want to do it, that'll end the discussion. But I'm going to presume that won't be the case. So that's how I think it would make sense to proceed. Yes, Regent Rocha. To the, to the motion itself, I, you know, a comment that you just made a moment ago uh, you know, strikes me that you know, I, I tend to see the vice chair, you know, the most critical issue is somebody that's up to date and can step in in the event of an absence of the chair. Um, I will say the last couple of weeks in the absence of, or the last, uh, in the absence of a vice chair, I, I have felt very well informed and consulted um, on matters. And to the extent that I would almost move to amend it to make it 11 vice chairs so that we continue to have that kind of opportunity to know what's going on and provide input on these things. And so I would, I would, I would be disappointed if, um, if we move forward with uh, this this uh, motion in an election, if it then turned back into uh, a leadership team that you know, sort of sets the table for the rest of us, and and we don't have as much input as we've had um, fairly recently. So, that's that's my commentary on it, uh, with respect to um, the role of the what would then be the co-vice chairs. Any further comments? Are you raising? Is that yes. pen mean you want Sorry. to speak? <laughs> Regent Speaker. Madam Chair. Thank yes. You. I'm not sure that this is a, a big issue one way or another, folks, but it just smacks to me that we're trying to be too cute by half. There's an old line, you would be trying to be too cute by half. Make a decision. We are elected to make a decision. It almost seems like uh, it's a non-decision to have co-vice chairs. And as Regent Rosa says, why not try vice chairs? Uh, a uh, quadruple uh, uh, vice chairs. It, it, we, we're elected to make a decision. Let's go ahead and make a decision um, rather than being too cute by half. And uh, I, I suppose, Regent Rocha, to answer your first question, we, if we have an absence of the chair. By the way, I don't think the most important role of the vice chair is to chair the committee if, in fact, the chair is gone. I think it's the support and the uh, uh, sharing of information, knowledge, experience beforehand uh, in preparation for decision. Uh, but I, uh, I will join you in opposing uh, the motion. I just think we, we could have two gavels here, I suppose, uh, at some time or another, if that be necessary. But let's make a decision. That's what we're elected to do. We're elected to make a decision, not a non decision. Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Speaking to the motion and not candidacy, um, of which I'm one of the two self-identified candidates. Uh, and I'm glad I can speak to it because that kind of caught me by surprise um, in the prior one. In my email to you all earlier, you know, I'd stated um, that I preferred to wait and, and that was just, um, you know, the 10 days there for a reason. Obviously it's a truncated period, but then also with an impending election, which seems to 
not confirmed, but seems to you know possibly be happening. That was the preference, but I was prepared to obviously speak to candidacy either way. What I'm hearing though, um, you know, which might explain Regent Verhalen's really trying to make this work is is the support that's needed in you know in the interim. I think you, you know you kind of spoke to it. Um, um, just now, right? Uh, at now, rather than any other time. So, and that's why I would appreciate it discussing that other motion because that's the other side of it that it's already a short period and there's a lot of work to be done in this of any period. So, I, I mean, I guess I'm prepared to to move forward. However, this you know this board decides whether that's Regent for Halen's proposal or if. Again, if, if the original motion to suspend the bylaws had passed, I would have been happy to move forward with that and see the outcome, right? But, um, you know, I am in support of finding whatever's an appropriate resolution. Um, but the, I guess my reaction to the first motion was not candidacy based. It was, it was, it was uh, on what I had alluded to to the email. So um, I, I'm, I'm amenable to, to what this board uh, decides. Any further discussion? Am I correct that this motion needs to pass also by a two thirds vote because it is a motion to suspend the bylaws? Okay. That's right. All right. Then um, do you want to state, can you state the motion? Yes. All right. Please. <laughs> on on the motion to suspend. That is. is someone trying to speak? On the motion to suspend the bylaws and create uh, the position of co-vice chairs through June 30th of 2023. That's as, as I understand it. All right. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. And if you would call the roll. All right. Regent Davenport. No. Regent Davenport votes no. Regent Farnsworth. Uh, yes. Regent Farnsworth votes yes. Regent Hipsch. Yes. Regent Hipsch votes yes. Regent Ruth Johnson. Yes. Regent Ruth Johnson votes yes. Regent Tad Johnson. Yes. Regent Tad Johnson votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Powell. Yes. Regent Powell votes yes. Regent Rosha. No. Regent Rosha votes no. Regent Swigum. No. Regent Swigum votes no. Regent Tayurabe. Yes. Regent Tayurabe votes yes. Regent Verhalen. Yes. Regent Verhalen votes yes. Chair Mayron. Yes. Chair Mayron votes yes. The motion carries nine to three. Uh, so we now have the opportunity to have uh, to proceed with uh, nominations for the co vice chair position. Yes, Regent Verhalen. Regent Mayron, I would be pleased to nominate Regents Kenyanya and Hipsch for the positions positions of co-vice chair of this board for the interim period. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Pardon? Ah, wait. Are there further nominations? Yes. Hearing none. Any discussion on the motion? Yes, Regent Verhalen. I would like to know if either Regent Kenyanya or Regent Hips would like to at least say a few words and confirm that they are still willing to accept <laughs> such a nomination uh, at this point in time. Regent uh, Hips, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, Chair Mayron and to Regent Cordy Verhalen. Yes, I'd be honored to serve as vice chair. My I'll work hard. I promise that. And um, I'll I love Minnesota. I love the University of Minnesota. I'll do whatever I can to help it along. I'll try to be a good listener with all you. Uh, it takes 12 of us to really make good policy happen, and all 12. And so I happily do it. So thank you. And thanks for the nomination. Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair, Regent for Halen. Um, I think I love the university more. I'm kidding. I, you've been loving it for a lot longer. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's <interesting. laughs> yeah, I was Take length say. of service times love. I've got you. Okay, all right. So, so, Regent Kenyan, do you know the rule of holes? Uh, huh? The rule of holes. Uh, yeah, so but I'll let you say it. To, to quit digging. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I, I will take note of that. No, but um, I mean, obviously, um, being willing to serve is, is all about supporting the board. And, um, you know, I think I'm willing as as Regent Hipsch is, um, as, as well as the pivot, right? Because I, I think something uh, Regent Swiggum pointed is it's not just in the absence of the chair, it's supporting um, while the chair is there. And that's kind of what we've seen in this dialogue, that that's needed uh, more now than ever. So um, however, we're able to support for the interim and, and um, of course thereafter, I, you and I had a conversation the other week um, about about committees and just roles on the board. And I think our conclusion was, you know, whatever happens, wherever we end up, we're, we're going to be able to serve. And I, I don't think we imagined this one, but you know, we'll 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 uh, we'll both happy to serve as well. Yeah. Any further discussion? I'm sure. Yes, Regent Rocha. Thank you. Would the candidates yield to a question? Yes, uh, uh, will you each yield to a question <laughs> from your colleague? Why not? Yeah, maybe the last time. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you. I, you know, I, I was, you know, anticipating quite some time ago that uh, that, that my successor uh, would be uh, in this position to to make a decision both for the the, I guess, interim uh, vice chair uh, leading up to the next uh, election for a two year term. Um, so to some extent, I'm asking the question on behalf of someone who I don't yet know uh, who it will be. Um, uh, so I, you know, for me, it's very important that that the seat that I hold has a seat at the table. And so um, one is what is your commitment to keeping your colleagues informed in the process of decision making, not just in terms of the result, um, returning phone calls, um, initiating phone calls. And then the second, the second question is a broader one, which is um, there's a great deal of debate uh, continuing across the country, but at this institution in particular, about uh, the role of a board. And you know, you're probably quite familiar with my sense that this is an important board to be a constructive skeptic and exert oversight in the process of governing the university, and that other other entities that surround it oftentimes get very involved, and at times can almost become a surrogate. What is your perspective on the role of this board um, in, in the position as vice chair and co-vice chairs and potentially co-chairs? Before you answer, let me just say that I think, um, with all due respect to the questions you're asking, and I think they're very important questions, I think this is a board decision to ultimately to wrestle with what is the role of the board, what is the role of colleagues vis-a-vis -vis each other. I think uh, asking these two individuals at this time to commit to what they might do without having the opportunity to discuss this issue on a larger basis as to how we all see our respective roles vis-a-vis -vis each other and the community at large, I think is an inappropriate question to ask at this time. And I am going to call the question at this time. So, all those in, <laughs> yes. What is the question? The question is, the motion before us is we have uh, nominations for two individuals. We have no other nominations. My understanding is this is a majority vote. So at this time, I am going to call the question and we will take the vote at Ma this time. Madam Chair, I, I appeal the ruling of the chair. That, that was remarkable. Thank you. That is a- Thank well, you, Regent Rocha. Yeah, and, and I I find it stunning. The, the heavy gavel. I, I, I believe I have a right, to, if they wanna give me a short answer, they can give me a short answer. I'm trying to decide whether I want to vote yes or no on the motion in front of us. I understand. And so you, you, boy, well, good luck all of you. Well, let me put it to my fellow uh, Regent Rocha and Regent, I'm sorry, Regent Kenyanya and Regent Hipsch, if you wish to answer the question individually with your own personal opinion in response to Regent Rocha, so he can make a decision, feel free if you choose not to. As I've said, I've stated, I think this is a board decision about how we conduct ourselves after we have an opportunity, but I certainly don't want to come, uh, deprive Regent Rocha of whatever information he needs to make a decision on this vote. So I'll start with Regent Hipsch. Sure, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I mean, 
so I don't have any silver bullet that that's going to fix everything that's wrong here. You know, not saying that there's a lot wrong, but I don't have any silver bullet. Okay, I'm a good communicator. I've chaired a lot of boards. I've been vice chair of a lot of boards, and I think I'm a good communicator. And I think you know, I try to reach out to all the board members and uh, get their input, get their ideas, because we each represent about eight percent of the population of Minnesota, just over. And so, um, so we all bring our our past, our skills, our ideas, and that's how we make decisions in a governance way. And right now we have a few things that are ahead of us. Picking a new president is number one. And um, picking an interim president is number one, and picking a permanent president is number two. I can't think of anything more crucial to the board in the next, whatever we're on, until June 30th, <laughs> then it's somebody else's chance to do it. So, but got my word, I'll work hard. Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I think in, in speaking with most of my colleagues, in, in, including you um, in the past week or so, um, one, one thing I said is I think the more we can focus on governance when we're here and, and less on our own internal issues, this is an ironic time to say that, um, I, I think we'll be better off and be able to serve the community better. So that, that's a role that I see leadership playing and being able to to um, I, as you were alluding to, you know, make sure we we have the information we need and 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 are informed so that we're not having some of those discussions here when we should be discussing mission and, and some of the important priorities um, in front of us. So and I think I think we're all aware of some of the ways we differ in how we look at governance and I, you know, it's appropriate um, at a board. Um, but, you know, I've, I've been pretty, you know, open and hopefully consistent with um, my desire to see a little more board involvement. Um, and, and I think we've, we've seen some of that uh, actually in, in the most uh, very recently, you know, so um, I would look forward to contributing to that as well so that when we get to McNamara, um, you know, we're talking about the colleges and, and extension and, and the mission. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further, Regent Rocha? No, thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Any other discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Yeah, I think Regent oh, says. Regent Farnsworth, I'm sorry. No, thank you, Chair Mayor. And I just originally re raised my hand to speak to the motion. I think, you know, um, originally why I had opposed the last one was just due to wanting to hopefully give a little bit more time for the election process to play out and see where we get to, um, well, you know, maybe unexpected. I think um, this is a creative solution, you know, that Regent for Halen has come up with. Um, and we're doing a lot of things kind of in uncharted territory um, at the moment. Um, and so if this, you know, will, for all the reasons that have been previously discussed, provide support to the leadership team, um, provide support to the entire board, um, and then get us through to when, um, Hopefully, nothing's ever guaranteed with this process, but where I would hope that it's likely in July that we're settled um, with our board, or whenever our annual meeting is, um, when we're settled with our board composition, then um, it, that'll absolutely be an appropriate time to have other, you know, the full new composition weigh in um, on leadership, which I think is appropriate and, and needed. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm supportive of this, and um, my it's 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 an unconventional but good solution. So. All right, thank you very much. Any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. All right, thank you very much. We now have two vice chairs. Very appreciative of your creative solution, Regent Verhalen. I'm more appreciative of their willingness to take on this job. So thank you. <laughs> Thank All right, <laughs> uh, let's move on now to the presidential transition expectations. This too is a review and action item. In this uh, section, we will discuss the transition issues related to President Gable's departure and to set expectations for the remainder of her tenure. At the request of board leadership, President Gable provided a memo that outlined a variety of open issues and projects in her office and across the university administration. Regent Powell and I then met with President Gable to discuss the memo. And that memo uh, has, uh, we've provided materials to you uh, regarding that memo. 
What I would like to do uh, as we move into this topic is I would like to suggest that we focus on a smaller subset of issues that require the board's guidance during the transition period as outlined in the docket. And what I'd like to do then is walk through those issues and my recommendations based on the conversations and information that uh, Regent Powell and I obtained when he was chair and then turn to the motions and discussions. So with that, I'm going to start with MPAC 2025. Uh, the last remaining deliverable, the tuition and pricing model, is scheduled to be presented by Provost Croson to the board in May. My recommendation is that President, Gabe, President Gable continue to consult with Provost Croson on the tuition and pricing model. So what I'd like to do is uh, get people's reactions, see if you agree or disagree with that, and then we'll move on to the next uh, item. So any any comments about that? Well, Madam All right. Chair, yes. A quick comment. I think it's critical. Um, enrollment will have a direct consequence. Enrollment is a key factor for us, both at this campus as well as Crookston and Morris and Duluth. So it's absolutely critical that uh, it's involved with the provost. Anybody else? All right, then we're going to move on to the next item. Uh, next is the president's recommended fiscal year 2024 operating budget. Given the timing of the legislative session, this year's operating budget will come before the Finance and Operations Committee for review at the regular June meeting and for action at a special meeting of the board in late June. My recommendation is that President Gable stays involved in the development of the operating budget and that the budget comes to the board with the president's recommendation in June, but that the president does not present the budget to the board uh, at the when we finally uh, have it before us for a uh, vote. Any reaction by colleagues here to my recommendation? Yes, Regent Fairhaven. Madam Chair, just as an overall point on all of this, this is to your recommendation that President Gable stay involved in these and then as we go through, depending on your recommendation, but if we appoint an interim, an interim president, yes. um, that they will then be feeding into these various recommendations as time allows, correct? Or that I guess that will be up for discussion as to what the interim president will be doing along the way. Yes, I mean, when we get to, if you looked at the position description, um, for the interim president, it contemplates that that person will begin officially on July 1 of 2023. So our hope is to, in fact, select uh, and invite to this person uh, by May 12th. And between May 12th and July 1, presumably this person as part of the transition will be in conversations with President Gable and others as well on a variety of items, including the budget that will be presented to us. But that because that person will not actually be on our payroll, um, having a recommendation from them prior to July 1 isn't going to be feasible. So uh, the thought here is she is President Gable is very well versed in this and all the nuances that are presented by an operating budget and that we need her continued knowledge and involvement until she actually departs. But the presumption is she is bringing on board that interim president so as to understand that. And to the extent they have input thoughts, presumably it's going to be part of the discussion. But the reality is they can't make the recommendation until they're employed. I appreciate that clarification, Chair Mayron, and thank you. Any, any other reaction to this recommendation? All right. Then uh, moving to the process then for fiscal year 2023 performance reviews and related salary adjustments for direct reports and staff in the office of the president. Performance review meetings with direct reports and staff of the office of the president would typically be scheduled for April and May. In addition to the directive that was provided to President Gable on April 12, as noted in the DACA materials, my recommendation is that President Gable proceeds with the reviews with the following conditions. 
prior to delivery of reviews to her direct reports and staff in the office of the president, President Gable will share those written will share all written evaluations, employee self-evaluations, and proposed salary adjustments with Vice President for Human Resources, Ken Horseman. Ken Hor Vice President Horseman will review her recommendations before delivery to the direct reports and staff, and will report to board leadership if there's anything unusual or concerning that is being recommended by President Gable. President Horseman, one of his designees, or the interim president, will attend all performance review meetings of direct reports and staff in the office of the president. That's my recommendation. Uh, any reaction to that recommendation? Yes, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. I guess I, my only reactions are that maybe just getting a little bit more of an understanding of what unusual or concerning would mean in this context, and then um, this is more minor, but you know, Vice President Horseman himself being a direct report, then I'm assuming that one would be handled separately. Um, but those are my only two things. I think I, I'm glad to see that this one was called out because I know I've had um, former discussions about this. You know, this is um, in particular a standard thing to look at when an executive is transitioning and not wanting to set something up. So those would be my only two reactions to that. Okay. Um, so on the, let's um, address your first uh, reaction. Um, and if you can remind, I get the, uh, the, I understand the part about who is going to review her review of, pre of Vice President Horseman. But the first one was. So like what unusual and concerning mean for, this is just an example, if, uh, if um, I want to use the right terminology, if pay adjustments looked abnormally high or out of scale. Would that be an example? Yes. Something, okay. You know, I think this is where we would rely on the expertise of Vice President Horseman, that if he saw something that was out of the norm, the normal, uh, what he has seen in the past, something that stands out, he would bring it to our attention. Okay. Uh, and as far as his own review, that is a good point as to uh, who will sit in on his review. Um, and uh, it, make sure that there's nothing um, out of line with that. And uh, to be honest, I haven't thought about that, and I don't think uh, Regent Powell thought about that either. Um, it could be, for example, uh, someone from the leadership team that would sit in uh, with President Gable on that, um, or perhaps um, Vice President, um, Senior Vice President Franz could sit in on it, but he too is a direct court report. So I don't know, I, my initial thinking is that probably someone here from the Board of Regents would sit in on that to make sure that it was going as planned and that we have knowledge of what she said. I mean, that part of it is to carry over historically whatever it is she's sharing and making sure that those of us who remain and the administration remains are party to the discussion. So that's just a thought about who would sit in on Vice President Horseman's. But uh, any other reactions? Regent Rocha. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm, I, in the language it talks about you know, stuff you know, that April, May, um, do, we have, do we have critical processes that, that can't be delayed in any way until the interim is, is on board? Um, so, you, well, on board meaning, is there any reason we can't wait until after July? Um, because if that person won't be on board until July 1, officially. Is that what you mean? Um, in terms of, well, I mean, I guess that, that's a decision that um, s seems to stem from the departure of the current president. Is that how you come to the July 1? I, the right now, as I said, the position description contemplates that the interim president would begin on July one. So uh, that that's what we have advertised to those out there. So right now, we we haven't obviously we don't know who it is, and we haven't had a discussion about with that unknown person whether they'd be willing to start before July one. Uh, so that's all we've represented to the public at this time. So my question is, if you're talking about delaying it until the interim president is on board, I think we need to assume that person will not be on board until July 1, unless we reach an agreement otherwise with that individual 
and or and or President Gable. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, then my I guess my take on this, I I would prefer that's not the case. I would prefer that, um, much as our initial conversations when we received the um, the the, the uh, notice um, on that Monday uh, about the transition of our current president, uh, that you know, bringing on an interim sooner than later makes sense. I mean, just you know, I, as as I pointed out that. It's different when the president is leaving the presidency and joining your faculty um, it's, uh, versus when your president is leaving and going to another institution. And, and while it is a light um, competition, there is competition. Uh, all, all universities compete for students and faculty and uh, research dollars and the like. And so to me, once that once that loyalty has been expressed um, as, as making the move, we as an institution, I think, are well served by bringing somebody on to, to step in and, and be singularly focused on this university. Um, and so um, my preference would be that the person, once they're identified, has an opportunity to, you know, as soon as they're able to come in and start picking things up. July is a long time away. I would agree that that's a, that's a little more to ask of, of these folks. But my, my preference would have been that the, the that President Gable would provide input as to the performance on, on uh, the individuals in, in this group, uh, but that the interim with you know, the board would then be taking over the, the issue of, of compensation changes. Um, you know, there are you know, we, examples of, of um, leaders leaving institutions, leaving universities, um, and making some fairly substantial um, uh, compensation decisions related to, to folks that are either also leaving or, or remaining there. Um, at, this own, at our own institution, we had an issue with that. Uh, in previous decades, so um, just want to be very, very mindful of that. And um, by no means is this a, you know, a, a commentary on the, the performance of the people involved, uh, but at the same time, I think that we owe it to the public that we represent that we're very mindful of the transition and, and make sure that we're being as, as focused as we can on controlling uh, these costs and making sure that we're not setting up a problem for the permanent president uh, a year or so from now. Thank you. Any reaction or response to Regent Roche's comment? Yes, Regent Verhalen. I think those concerns are already addressed in the chair's recommendation, which include that <clears throat> Vice President Hortzman, one of his designees, or the interim president will attend all performance review meetings of direct reports and staff in the office of the president, and that Vice President Hortzman will review before delivery um, the self-evaluations and proposed salary adjustments. And then the chair's comment that as soon as an interim is appointed by us, that we will begin onboarding as quickly as possible. Their official position as interim president of the University of Minnesota will not begin until July 1st, but that does not prevent them from being part of the layover process, for lack of a better term. That is what I am what I have heard and what I'm seeing in these recommendations. Other comments and reaction? Um, yes, Regent Kenyanya. Thank you, Madam Chair. Briefly, um, you know, I, I understand the Regent Roche's mindset, or wait, not his mindset, his concerns. <laughs> I can't speak to anyone's mindset. Um, but, um, and maybe it's just spending a lot of time thinking about audit. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about those delineations. Um, but I, you know, to Regent Verhalen's point, especially those especially the people in the president's office, I don't know who else could actually you know, review them or speak to them. I mean, we have, we have, this recommendation has mechanisms based out of the same concerns, but at least that review, you know, I don't know if there's anyone else that could actually speak to um, the people in the president's office, uh, office's performance. So, um, you know, if there's modifications, to this recommendation, I think those would make sense. But I mean, structurally, it, it does have to be the president, in my opinion. Uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. One more clarification. So I'm reading just, I'm comparing the, the board leadership direction from April 12th and then the chair recommendation. And so the board leadership recommendation on April 12th speaks to pay adjustments, promotions or demotions, transfers, hires or terminations. And then the chair's recommendation only speaks to uh, written evaluations and proposed salary adjustments that would be reviewed by the chair or by um, Vice President Horseman. So I just want to make sure that those are 
aligned um, for clarity purposes. So no more will the chair, the leadership team, we'll refer to it as because we have a new structure now. Um, so no more will the leadership team review all pay adjustments, promotions, demotions, transfers, hires, or terminations. The leadership team's only reviewing something if Vice President Horseman flags it. Um, and then, I, yeah, I just noticing that the language is a little different. So this is getting a little technical, but I just want to make sure that the president and her team have all that clarity and we have that clarity as well. Do you have the language? Um, is it in the board materials? Pardon? I, I don't have it. But it is in the doc. Okay. No, I'm just reading from the docket. Yeah, and let me just get the docket. Madam Chair, it's in italics just above where it says chair recommendation All right. on the last page of this yeah. item. No, but I have yeah, got it here. All right. So I can tell you the background of this, and, and uh, Regent Powell can certainly weigh in as well. But when we issued the April 12 um, directive, it was to make sure that nothing was basically happening in this area until we had an opportunity to come before the board in a, and, and in a robust and fulsome fashion talk about transition issues. Um, and so in talking with President Gable, what she identified in terms of what's left, what's on her plate right now between now and June, what's left on her plate really is only her reviews and any compensation recommendations that she would make. So I, I think you have to put the two of them together is my own view. Um, and whether one supersedes the other, I think you gotta marry the two together because there is some overlap. But the reality is all that President Gable currently has on her plate as it relates to issues is, perform is doing the performance review, those who report to her, and making those recommendations with respect to compensation for increases on a going forward basis. So I, I, we're going to have to marry the two together, um, if that answers your question. I believe it does. Yeah, I'm just making sure from a language standpoint, you know, the, I'm just focusing on the chair's recommendation. Yeah, I would assume because it calls out um, proposed salary adjustments separately and then it just says written evaluations. And so I presume promotions or demotions, transfers, hires, and terminations would be included with those broader categories under the chair's recommendation. That's I think that's that's where you marry the two together. Right. So I, my own view, and Regent Powell can speak to his own view, is to the extent that if President Gable, between now and the time she leaves, is about to attempt a promotion or a demotion or a transfer or a hire a termination, it's going to have to be reviewed. And, and we set it up right now, it would be by the chair, and now it would be by the vice chairs, so that she wasn't acting independently at the time. It, it, now, on a going forward basis, I'm willing to guess we would be consulting with Vice President Horseman about that to get his input as well, but the, the whole point of this is to make sure that she's not acting independently on employment related matters until she departs, that there is an oversight process in place. Okay, that that's clear. Yeah, so it, it's not just that you're reviewing something if it's flagged, you're really at, there's a broader review. So okay, yes. got it, got it. Thank you. There is. And, and l let me just speak to um, the issue I think that that um, Region Rosa has raised about maybe we should be waiting until we have a, a, a new interim president and, and that Regent, or I'm sorry, President Gable should be, not be making these decisions. And I understand where you're coming from that. But to be frank, at least my own view is in fairness to these people, they, they her direct reports and her staff, they didn't ask for this situation. And I don't think they should be penalized from having, being, having the um, be part of the normal course of what they are entitled to, uh, which is a review and any recommendation, and that the, really the only person who is knowledgeable to review their performance in the past year is the president. So waiting until we have an interim president who will have no information uh, to do it when they come on in July 1, um, and I don't think would be very helpful to those individuals in terms of performing the review, waiting to me it is not a good employment practice. So. That's why I've made the recommend, we've made the recommendation that we did. 
Yes, thank Regent you, Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate those remarks. Uh, and in response to you know, Regent Verhalen's comments, where, where I was looking at, I'm, I, there's a kind of an undefined term I don't re will review before delivery. So I, I wasn't really sure where the delivery goes. And, and I, by no means, would I think that the, the, in the review process wouldn't include President Gable to the extent that she's in, in the mix. Uh, for the reasons that you just cited. Um, I, I, I do separate that a bit from the, the question of the ongoing uh, uh, compensation question. Um, and if, if, as this exchange reflects, that there is going to be active uh, engagement of the board leadership, anytime we're talking you know, state or tuition dollars, I'm, as you probably have observed, I'm pretty persnickety about that to make sure that we have that, that, that relationship. So. If this is, is as it's being described, it seems like a reasonable uh, approach to the to the, the matter. Um, it, it, it struck me as a, a bit odd, uh, you know, to, to um, um, kind of place uh, Vice President Horseman in this position. But it appears that, based on the description, that the resources will be available for anything that uh, comes out of the somewhat undefined um, exceptional circumstances. Okay, thank you very much. Any further discussion on this item or further reaction? Okay, going then to the next item, which is the chancellor search for the University of Minnesota at Morris. Uh, the status is public interviews with the four finalists, background checks and reference checks have been completed. President Gable is ready to move forward with an offer in preparation for bringing the appointment to the board for action at the May board meeting. It's my recommendation that President Gable offer the position to her recommended candidate and bring that recommendation to the board for action at the May regular meeting. And again, just to explain the background, it's probably pretty obvious. These people are waiting. They want to know. And um, and she and the whole process is complete. And we will be able to weigh in if we disagree. So that check and balance, in my view, is in place. And that's why I made the recommendation. Yes, Regent Hipsch. Uh, Chair Mehron, I agree with this recommendation. I think that's really important to fill that position. And we do have the final say at the May meeting. So I agree with you. Any further reaction to this recommendation? Uh, yes, Regent Roshan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, you know, my, my one caveat on this is the same that I had in, in, in approaching the search. In the, you know, going for the search in the first place, which is that, um, you know, the more uh, the University of Minnesota Morris is a critical asset of the university. It's a very important part of our educational offerings and and uh, research, and and uh, we have an incredible faculty and uh, staff in, in Morris. Um, going through this process, I I would would have liked to see us be you know, sort of more deliberate about the future of the campus and finding a chancellor that comes in with that specific skill set to work on uh, reversing what's been a challenging enrollment trend. Uh, because if Morris doesn't, um, if we don't see improvement in that regard, I think the campus has got some real challenges in the, in the, in the not so distant future. So um, you know, to the extent that I don't really have a great sense of, of what the specific uh, skill set will be for a, you know, and a chancellor, you know, chancellor should you know, obviously have a long tenure in these positions. And so um, I, I'm just expressing a bit of concern on my behalf and on behalf of whoever is sitting here um, as this person is, is moving through the, um, the, 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 the paces of the position um, that it would be you know, very helpful to have a clear understanding of what President Gable is looking for, what skill set um, the president is looking for to make sure that, that whoever she does bring before the board is going to uh, have a, a vision for the future success of the University of Minnesota Morris. Thank you. Any further reaction or comment? All right, uh, moving on to the next item, which is tribal relations. The American Indy, uh, President Gable has indicated that the American Indian Advisory Board annual meeting with the president is scheduled for May 4. Uh, as this meeting, uh, and subsequent presentations to the board complies with the Board of Regents policy on American Indian advisory boards. It's my recommendation that President Gable will attend this meeting, the annual meeting with Karen Diver, senior advisor to the president for Native American affairs. 
Any reaction to this particular item? Yes, Regent Hardsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayor. Uh, my only reaction is, um, you know, I was I was brought comfort that senior advisor to um, the president, our Karen Diver, our senior advisor to the president for Native American Affairs, was attending. I say that just due to the really important nature of this work um, from a short and long term standpoint, um, and in the relational um, nature of this work as well. Also thinking about the the reports that you know we all received and it's been talked about. Recently, the the Tribal Healing Truth Project report, um, and so the reason I speak to this and and also maybe make this small recommendation and be curious what other colleagues think is I think um, not only is is our American Indian Advisory Board's policy a Board of Regents policy, um, the board has also been highlighted significantly in that report, which I've talked with you about, uh, Chair Mayor, on, and and we'll be hopefully getting to that soon. Um, that uh, I think it would be great if some, if, if a regent or subset of regents was engaged in this as well. And I would actually make that suggestion um, regardless of, of talking about it in the context of a transition. Uh, and so that would be my only thing is I think it's important that the president attends. I think it's great that Karen Diver is going as well, but perhaps a, a regent or a few regents also engage in that just um, given particularly the context that we're in, but then the importance of the work and how the board has been very, I think, um, publicly and, and of course appropriately so um, brought into this work that we'll be having more conversations about later. So that would be my only thought on, on this. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Tad Johnson. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to shut my camera off there. I was trying to do something else. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to say that I uh, I believe uh, this is an important meeting uh, for uh, for the tribes and uh, the relationship that we've built up with the uh, 11 Native Nations of Minnesota over the last couple of years has been very important. And um, uh, I think the, this, uh, this board passed uh, uh, rewrote the uh, American Indian Advisory Board policy. And um, uh, I think hearing from the Native Nations um, is is extremely important. And I, I hope that uh, the meeting goes ahead as planned. And um, just, uh, just to associate myself with uh, uh, what Regent Farnsworth said, um, uh, if some of us are in attendance, if that's possible, uh, I would certainly like to go. So thank you. All right. Uh, any further reaction or reaction to Regent Farnsworth's suggestion that one or more regents also attend this meeting with President Gable and with uh, Karen Diver? Yes, Regent Hitch. Uh, Chair Mayor, Ron, I agree with uh, Regent Farnsworth and Johnson and having some regents attend if they could. Yes, Regent, thank you very much, Regent Hitch. Regent Verhalen? Thank you, Chair Mayron. I support that, but I do think that uh, Senior Advisor to the President Karen Diver should be consulted on that as to who, what is appropriate given the um, attendance at that meeting, who is there, what they're expecting as far as the board inserting itself into a meeting like that. Uh, do you agree with that suggestion? Yeah, no, I agree with that. And that's why I went only as far as to suggest it. Um, absolutely, we'd want um, the guidance on how to approach that in an appropriate manner. Um, but just given, again, short and long term um, relationship building and managing transition, I think um, you know, having the board present would be good. Absolutely in the appropriate manner. All right. Any further discussions? Uh, Regent Ted Johnson, were you raising your hand or no? <laughs> Okay, all right. <laughs> Any further discussions on this particular item? All right, excellent suggestion, Regent Farnsworth. Um, the next item has to do with uh, President Gable's um, what's on her calendar between now and the date of her departure um, and in terms of uh, to give her guidance on what it is we would like her to do. And the assumption is that what we don't discuss are things that we would expect that she would not be doing or others would be doing it uh, in lieu of her. And in that regard, uh, 
uh, we got the list from President Gable and then I uh, approached President Gable and asked her uh, with respect to those items or activities, external activities, between now and June 30th, which one she believed it was important that she should attend or that she thought was appropriate in her role as president to attend. So I didn't ask her which ones didn't you think you needed to do. I said, which ones, as you look at this list, which ones would you recommend that you should, you should be present at? And I have that information for you, so I want to go through it. it. It follows what she has in her memo. And the idea here is, um, and you'll have to bear with me, is that um, if we disagree with her recommendation, then we'll talk about it. And if we agree it shouldn't be on her plate, then we'll take it off her plate. So that's the idea is to give her guidance on what she should be doing over the next several weeks. So the first item on uh, the memo, and you have the memo, was her April 24th Zoom meeting. It is with the Association of Public Land Grant Universities, uh, April CEC meeting, and the CECE, I had to make sure I remembered what that was, um, is the uh, Commission on Economic and Community Engagement. So um, it is a leadership meeting. Um, she is on the chair of the, she is the chair of it. So she says that, as, that uh, for the, the national organizations of the APLU, CECE, and Fulbright, she does those. She's representing Minnesota until her last day of Minnesota for the CECE, which is the Commission on Economic Community Engagement. We have the national conference that is set in Duluth in early June, and she is chairing that conference. So she recommends that she continue in her role uh, with that. Um, <coughs> First of all, on April 24th on, in, with the Zoom conference and then also at the National Conference in Duluth, which is in early June. Yes, Regent Farnsworth. Well, I would just say I, I don't know if the Zoom calls already happened today or not, <laughs> but the first Zoom call would have been today and the next item would be today as well. So you are maybe right. we. Yeah, I didn't maybe we no in. I didn't I realized it about halfway through so um but to your point about the the obligation as a whole with the conference so just looking at that June date then um well I wasn't really intending to speak to that but just making the date point but the conference is fine with me too all right and uh, to be honest we'll be getting to it when we get to our right June so conference. just making the point about the yeah, first two I, on the I memo. think your your point is well taken and I didn't catch it I don't know if she already attended it or she was going to do it this evening um, but it, I did have it on there. All right. Well, I think we can probably move on from April 24th. <laughs> ship is sailing, no yep. matter what. All right. Let's look at uh, April 26th, which is on campus. It's with the foundation, uh, the UMF Board of Trustees Executive Committee meeting with uh, UMF video message recording. Um, and she says, although there is a call being scheduled with one donor who is focused on our SDG work that is being scheduled. So um, SDG, I think, is our uh, sustainability. Um, we know what SDG stands for. Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you. Yes, I, I got the sustainable, then I couldn't <laughs> pull out the rest. No problem. So she recommends that she um, continue to participate with the UMF at that particular on-campus um, meeting and at the call that is being scheduled with one donor who is focused on our sustainable donor. Um, what's the G stand for? Development. All right. That's being scheduled for that day as well. Any reaction to her continued involvement on the 26th on that matter? All right. Also on April 26th at the Mall of America, uh, as you know, we're hosting these 2026 Special Olympics U.S. Games. It is the logo reveal event uh, for the University of Minnesota uh, hosting of the games. She was planning to do that particular meeting, go to that Special Olympics meeting on the 26th on behalf of the university. Any reaction or objection to that? All right. On April 27th, Big Ten Conference. Uh, council, the presidents and chancellors meeting. Uh, her intention would be to do the Big Ten conference until an interim is named. And she indicated you can't send anyone to those meetings except the president or the interim president. So 
uh, on the assumption we won't have an interim president by April 27th, I think that's pretty clear. We won't have one by the 27th. Uh, the recommendation is that she attend on behalf of the University of Minnesota. Any objection? All right, on May 1, there is the University President's Roundtable 2023 check-in, and it refers to number two, and I'm not sure what that is, other than I think it's of University Presidents, and they have a roundtable, and they check in, and as long as she's the president, it's a Zoom conference, she's recommending she attend on behalf of the University. All right, no reaction there. May 8th, uh, Association of Public Land Grant Universities, May uh, CEC Leadership Meeting, and the APLU Commission on Economic and Community Engagement. She is the chair. Um, again, uh, her intention is she do does those. Uh, she represents Minnesota until her last day at Minnesota. Um, and again, she notes that there is a conference in Duluth uh, in early June, which we'll get to in a minute. So she is indicating that she believes she should attend that meeting on behalf of the University of Minnesota. Any reaction? All right, next item, May 8th, also on May 8th, a Zoom or at McNamara. Um, this is the Embold second quarter executive council meeting. This is a meeting uh, with the Greater Minnesota uh, MSP Partnership, the Minneapolis-St. Paul Regional Economic Development Partnership. And she says it's the Soil and Health and Water Stewardship Champion. Her notes are indicated for the Medical Alley in Embold and Greater uh, MSP. We need to work with the board and the VPs to identify representatives and then she could hand those off. So. It sounds like that is one that could be handed off, but we'd have to do it by May 8th. And she'd be happy to work with uh, board leadership and uh, the vice presidents to identify who should attend on behalf of the university. Any reaction? All right, May 10th. Oh, Regent Chairman. Yes, I'm sorry, Regent Hipsch. Is that something we could put on our next uh, meeting agenda? Well, May 8th, our meeting actually, are you talking about the regular meeting? Oh, no, I'm just a meeting. Uh, special meeting to, and then we would do what? Well, appoint somebody to be on that. I don't, uh, it depends if the board wants to weigh in or perhaps this is something that could be worked with board leadership with yourself and myself and uh, <clears throat> Regent Kenyanya and with vice presidents to identify who would attend uh, on behalf of the university until we have our interim president in place. Uh, that, just a suggestion. Uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chairman Ron. I guess I would just ask more of a broader question to get an understanding of the president's recommendation here. So you had said um, just now she was referencing Embold, the, what were the, like the three ones that you just mentioned that she would be okay? This is, she says, for Medical Alley, Embold, and Greater Minnesota MSP. We need to work, I'm just reading what her notes say, we need to wait, work with BOR and VPs to identify representatives and then she can hand it off. So I'm just trying to read through a little bit here. So it's sounding like she, the preference would be to hand those off. That's how I would hear that. And then um, the, I, I would be fine with the leadership team just figuring that out personally. Any other reaction? Okay. All right, moving to the next item, May 10th. This is a Zoom conference. Uh, she has in parentheses, uh, attendance to be determined. This is the Minneapolis-St. Paul Regional Economic Development Partnership Greater MSP Board of Directors meeting. Um, and she writes topic focused director. She says for MBP and Greater MSP, I should do those until there's an interim for the same reasons as for the Big Ten. For Medical Alley and Bold Greater MSP, we need to work with the board, same thing in VPs, to identify representatives and she can hand them off. So that's a handoff one. It, it's a handoff on Medical Alley and Bold in Greater Minnesota, but for MBP, which stands for that's Minnesota Business Partnership and Greater MSP, I should do those until there's an interim in place for the same reasons that she should be attending the Big Ten Conference, until, which is until an interim's name, you, you should be the president. 
I believe that's what she's saying. Any reaction, Regent Rocha? Uh, um, stay focused on this specific issue. I, when I think about um, a relationship like with the the business partnership where it's there's it's really kind of a future dynamic i would you know an opportunity like that and, and uh, certainly those of you that are more familiar with the organization can, can, uh, correct me if, if they see it differently but you know i would i would be inclined to have um, somebody that's going to be here in a, in a, on a longer range uh, basis to to have that interaction just because it is i, I do tend to see it as being a, a Longer term enterprise, where as opposed to kind of a, a, a representation um, uh, role, uh, being that we're so close to that transition. Madam Chair. Yes. I understand that those positions are just like the Big Ten conference, where it's the president of the university who gets those seats as a director of those uh, at the meetings of that bo those boards of directors. And so perhaps it's a clarification for you to ask, but I would treat this one much like the um, Greater MSP Partnership one that we just discussed, where if that's not the case, where it's a, a position dedicated to the University of Minnesota president, which then the interim president can take over, that leadership, I work with the vice presidents to identify the right person. But that's how I under, understand the configuration of that item. My understanding is she's on the board of directors as a result of her role as president. So I don't, so my understanding for the discussions that Chair Powell or Regent Powell and I had, that that's, it's a position role as opposed to a person role. So I don't think that we can, I, we can verify that with her so that I don't, unless we've got our interim president in place, uh, that we can't send somebody else in her stead. Um, that's not how it works, but we can verify that with her. I understand the import of what people are saying, um, and particularly what Regent Rocha is saying about it, given this is about a business relationship and she's not going to be here anymore. I get that, but I'm not sure we're going to have the luxury of, of sending somebody else. If the choice is not sending anybody at all and it being vacant or sending President Gable, I'd rather be sending President Gable and continue to have a seat at the table. Yes. Any reaction? <laughs> All right. Um, May 10, it's either a Zoom or at Pillsbury Hall. Uh, it will be, uh, it's with the University of Minnesota Foundation. It's their trustee meeting and spring reception. And she is suggesting uh, that she would attend that on behalf of the university. Any reaction? All right, May 16 at the Minneapolis Club. It's the Minnesota Business Partnership, the Board of Directors Executive Committee. She is serving as the Executive Committee member. Um, and again, she believes, um, as was true for uh, the Minnesota Business Partnership and Greater Minnesota Partnership, I should do those until there's an interim for the same reasons for the Big Ten. In other words, it's just, she's doing that in her be based on her position, not because she's Joan Gable. So she would attend unless we happen to have a interim president on board employed with us by May 16. Okay. May 25, Big Ten Conference Council of Presidents and Chancellors meeting and Big Ten Conference Council of Presidents and Chancellors Executive Committee meeting. Again, same recommendation. I would do the Big Ten until an interim is named. We can't send anyone to those meetings except the president or the interim. So she would attend unless the interim was in place. Regent Kipsch? Yeah, clarification on that. So if we pick an interim by then, but they're not on staff, can they go? I think that's worth asking and uh, getting some clarification from President Gable whether that individual could go with her uh, for, again, for transition sake. Yeah, if uh, that's possible, I think that would be a good thing. I think that's really important. You know, as soon as we have that person in place to send them to these types of meetings. Let, let's can. inquire, and if the answer is that person could attend as well in anticipation of their yeah. employment, um, that we that that happened. Yeah. They're willing to do it. They're free that day. Yeah. All right. 
June 2 is the inauguration of Michael Schill, the Northwestern 17th president, uh, which is something she wants to attend, um, presumably on behalf of uh, the University of Minnesota in her capacity as president. Thoughts on that? Madam Chair? Yes. Do we know what, what, what an event like that would cost, cost the university? Do not. I assume we would be picking up her um, travel, and I don't know if that would involve a hotel or not, or whether it's just the travel expenses, but presumably it's the travel expense, um, unless anybody else has any intel on that. Just because you know, I'm having participated in some of these um, in the past, um, you know, it's not uncommon to have a provost represent an institution. Um, uh, you know, there's, you know, open questions about people who apply for the interim position and so on and so forth. So I don't want to, uh, you know, respond to that. But I mean, again, it's another one of those things where the ongoing relationship with the university uh, to me is, is is somewhat relevant, especially when you talk about a, a peer of this uh, situation like that. Any other reaction to President Gables attending on behalf of the university? Any other? I'm hearing Regent Rocha objecting. Yes, Regent Kipsch. I, I think it's really important that we have a president at the event, whether it's the current president or the interim president, pre, interim president. So somebody is there representing us because it's important to them. So, so your thinking is, if the interim president is employed, it ought to be the interim president. Yeah. But otherwise, you are comfortable having the president attend on behalf of the university. That's what you're saying. Yes, I think we should have somebody there. So other reactions? Seeing a nod of a head by Regent Ruth Johnson. Any other reactions? I think that representation is important. Somebody should be there. All right. Uh, now we get to the June 4 uh, Duluth meeting. This is of the Association of Public Land Grant Universities, their 2024 CECE summer meeting. Uh, she's hosting it. Um, and uh, she's the chair of the APLU Commission on Economic and Community Engagement. Um, and she is recommending that uh, we're having the national conference in Duluth in early June. She's chairing the conference and that she should be the one at the conference. Uh, um, presumably, unless we have an interim and, and she's no longer representing the university. Yes, Regent Perhalen. I'd add to that that if we are able to appoint an interim by that or pick an interim by that date and they're available on that date that we should encourage them to attend that as well with President Gable. Uh, if nothing else is a really great opportunity to introduce them to the APLU community. Yes, Regent Parsons. Uh, thanks, Chair Mayron. This is just a quick question um, in response to a lot of the suggestions around timeline and if we have an interim and maybe this is not best practice per HR but I don't the only thing I noticed when I looked at the interim search website earlier today was that it didn't specifically say anything about transition and I saw the July 1st thing but is it worth or is it best practice to have language there that says we would hope that this person is available to do these things earlier or they just might know because they watched this meeting and they've applied or do you see what I'm getting at I'm just making a process suggestion that doesn't necessarily have to be fleshed out now but in response to a lot of the things that I've heard, which I agree with, but that um, language or preference isn't necessarily reflected on the on the interim search website. So maybe something we could look at. Good suggestion. Any, yes, uh, Regent Davenport and then Regent Sviggum. Thank you, Chair. Just a friendly reminder, we have one president at a time. Do you want to expand on your comment? We have one president, one president through the term, mm -hmm. so you can't have two presidents, whether they're officially in or not. It's something that it, it's part of the transition, yes, but there is only one president. Okay, thank you. Uh, Regent Sviggum? Well, Madam Chair, I think Regent Davenport makes a good point and a really, really good point. Um, I, um, I think we have a great president. By the way, but I feel a little inadequate sitting here being the president's scheduler. Um, I'm expecting that President Gable will be president, fulfilling <coughs> all roles, all meetings, all duties, all responsibilities 
until the day she leaves, until the last day. At least that would be my expectation. Um, we're sitting here going through a process of saying when she should, uh, what she should attend and what she should not. She should be attending everything, doing all role, all responsibility of the president until the last day. Uh, tell me what things we've been talking for 30 minutes about things that we've been asking her to do or fulfilling or obligations. What is she not going to do? Well, can I answer your question? Please. Right. I, I was looking at you. For <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> there is a memo that uh, that she, uh, when she gave, following her giving notice of her resignation, Chair Powell at the time, and I asked her to basically go through and, and outline everything that was basically on her plate or that she could be, um, that needed to be addressed by either the university or her during the course of between now and her date of departure on June 30th. That's the big memo that you got that outlined a variety of things. And there are many things on there that she identified in her own opinion they are housed elsewhere. They can continue to be housed elsewhere. And she they are not things, while in theory, everything percolates up to her that she is not actively involved in. We then asked her to identify those in particular that she is actively involved in, which she did do. And then we asked her, I asked her to identify of all those that you are actively involved in, which are the ones that you think you really need to be, it ought to be you and not somebody else uh, in your stead. And th that's the subset. So I didn't intend to go through the entire memo of everything that is in theory reports up to the president. But you'll see at the end here, what I'm recommending is on these six buckets of information, yes, we're giving her the green light to go ahead. We agree this is what you ought to be doing. And as to all the other items that we're not talking about, the recommendation is they continue to proceed Wherever they're housed, again, the, everything is under her umbrella, but we're not expecting her to do any, um, to specifically take them on right now because we've identified the ones that really need her absolute personal attention. And so we're trying to ferret through that. That was the whole point of that big memo by her, and we ferreted it. We winnowed it down. Madam and going Chair. through this was to make sure that everybody's on board that She's going to be out there, as Regent Davenport says, we have one president and continuing to engage in activities representing us. And I want this whole board to feel comfortable with what she's out there doing with us until she departs on June 30th or whatever the date of departure is. I hope that answers your question. Does not, Madam Chair. All right. Madam Chair, my question is, what is she not going to do that is a role and responsibility? We've been laying out things she's going to do. You haven't told me in your well, we two minutes. You didn't tell me what she's not going to do on the list. I'm expecting President Gable, with my support and the support of the Board of Regents, to be fully engaged with every event, every opportunity, every meeting that she should be normally doing as president, representing the university until the last day she's here. Um, if, if I'm wrong, I, I'm not her scheduler. I'm not her Wondering why I'm doing her scheduling for her. Okay, fair enough. That's it. You know, see, you did not answer my question of what she's not going to do. All right. I'm going to try, and then I'm going to see the Regent Farns with us. Well, this. my yes, question is, is a little rhetorical. All right. Uh, a little rhetorical from the standpoint of being the scheduler, you know, yeah, you can tell me what she's not going to do. But I think she should be doing everything the full role, the full scope, the full events. I, I don't know why she wouldn't be, but. Appreciate what you're saying. Um, I can tell you her April 11th mem memo, which you all got, lays out everything that she sees as on her plate, either directly or indirectly. And what we've done is identify those that we expect her directly to. I am recommending that she directly continue her involvement in. And that the balance will be, just so we all know, while it all percolates up to her as the president, those items, the remaining items on the April 11th mem men or memo will not be something that she is directly involved in. So we tried to we tried to give, put our arms around what's it look like for the next six weeks or, or eight weeks 
Um, I, conceptually, I agree with you that, but I think people want to know what does that mean? What does that look like? How is she spending her day? Um, and so th that's good, the good exercise enough. we went through. Good enough. All right. I appreciate what you're saying. Thank you. Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. And, and Regent Sviggum, I certainly hear you on that, um, which is part of part of the reason I wanted to zero, you know, zoom back out, ask the process question. I appreciate um, and respect and rely on in the past and have moving forward Regent Davenport's um, professional experience in this area. So I wanted to hear more about that too. Um, but, you know, I think to Regent Sviggum's point, you know, there's a few nuances here. For instance, I, you know, I'm generally fine with everything on this memo that we're talking about now. I think the American Indian Advisory Board meeting, there's an argument to be made for the reasons we discussed for an exemption to that premise. And so um, I, that's kind of why I'm asking the process question. I was around in a much different capacity in 2019 um, when President Gable was coming on and what the president, the kind of office of the president designate was doing in that transition. I saw a little bit of that, but from a very different perspective. And so I'd rely on the regents who were here during that time to shed light on how that transition worked for us. And then assuming that the president, I have no idea what the president's transition responsibilities are to her incoming institution. And so I'm glad we're having this conversation. Um, that's kind of why I I get it's, a, it's ahead of where we're at, but it also, it's kind of a process question that's relevant for now. So I just wanted to explain a little bit more about that. I hear you, Regent Sviggum, about these individual meetings where I'm kind of like, sure, you know, leadership can figure out some of them that the president herself identified. It sounds like that she wanted some transition on, but then whatever her recommendation is for the rest of them, that's why I've been generally supportive too. So I just wanted to follow up on that. All right, thank you. I think Regent Powell. Yes, Regent Powell. Um, just a quick one. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, um, just affirming um, Regent Davenport's comment on uh, one at a time. Um, having, having said that, I think that it, and this, is, this is a small point, but I want to make it anyway. It has to do with as we get further into the transition, um, the idea of um, the president uh, accompanying uh, the interim president once that's possible um, to um, different meetings and, and different events for the purpose of making introductions, and, uh, you know, introducing the interim president, my view really, really positive um, way of affirming our process. It highlights that we have a smooth a transition in place. Um, it's, I think it strikes a really positive note, kind of grace note on the transition, and I'm um, very comfortable with that and encourage it. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, um, moving to the... Oh, I'm sorry, Regent Rocha. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I, I, in that same you know, position as Regent Spigum, where going through sort of item by item feels strange, doesn't feel very, you know, governance uh, uh, driven. Um, but I, you know, I, I come at it from somewhat of a different uh, position. As as we're talking about these, it's been a little challenging, you know, for me on the assessment. And I talked a little bit about a desire to see the interim moving into the role um, uh, sooner, uh, and, and that. that was, I guess I missed the July 1st um, on, the, on the posting, um, as I don't remember that being the, the, the dialogue the other day. Uh, when, when, a, when a president, and I, and I agree with the let's have one president, um, I, think that, I think that can be um, difficult and confusing for the community. I don't think it's necessarily devastating, but it, it's certainly better to have, have that kind of focus. But when, when a president surprises her board with uh, a departure, um, there are a lot of different ways that institutions handle it. Some of them, the person is essentially done at that moment. Others, you know, have them uh, serve throughout. That, that's more common uh, when the person is not going to a competing institution and to another institution. Um, but I feel like we're so heavy into the cart at this point and the horse conversation hasn't necessarily occurred. We have, um, you know, we have notice, we have some timing issues. Um, with, with the notice um, as to determining, you know, on, as a board, we never have had a conversation, at least in, that I've been privy to, about how we want to pursue the transition um, and the timing of the transition. There are hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake in the, in the contractual language that's in front of us. And I would, um, to me, it would you know, be extremely helpful to get 
a perspective on what our options are as it relates to how long we want the service to continue um, to the extent that uh, we have already kind of gone through and, and made certain decisions and I think at least of late good timely decisions about the interim um, I, I really feel like all of this should have been part of a, a uh, clearer conversation uh, by the full board as to how we want to work with the contract that's in front of us with the current president um, and the timing of pronouncement and etc so um, to that end madam chair I, I move uh, to direct the office of the Board of Regents to retain uh, outside counsel uh, to review the circumstances related to the president's announcement, the, the president's contract, and the obligations of the university. And once we have that conversation, I feel like many of these other conversations become a lot clearer. Uh, I'm going to indulge, say a matter of indulging. Um, it, it, we will entertain a motion, a second in a minute. I'd like to fit, we're almost done with this list. I'd like to get through it okay. and then I'd like to actually and then we'll ask for a second and if there's a second I'd like to take a short break uh, restroom break uh, because it's almost five o'clock here and then we'll, we'll come in and, and discuss your motion. So, Thank you. All right. But I'd like to finish what we're doing here um, one piece at a time. Would that be okay? That's fine. Madam Chair. All right. Sure. All right. So I think we were on um, June 21, 20 to 21. This is um, attending Location to be determined and attendance to be determined. This is the Association of Public Land Grant Universities, their Council of the President's Summer Meeting. Um, it's a national organization. She does those and represents Minnesota. She proposes and she do that until her last day. Um, my recommendation on that piece is um, right now she's asked that she be permitted to go on vacation, uh, take her vacation starting June 9th. And assuming that she is um, going to be taking her vacation starting June 9th, I would recommend that she not attend that meeting. Um, and um, if that means no one's there because our interim president hasn't started, then no one will be there at that point. Um, to me, either President Gable's on vacation or she's not. And so if she's going to be on vacation, she ought not to be engaged in those activities or the ones actually that are set for June 23rd. So that would be my recommendation on those two. All right. Um, then um, my intention was to then um, walk, get a motion to address what we talked about on all six of these items related to transition. And then uh, I thought we we're going to adjourn. But we do have this motion here. And so let's first see if we have a second. And then uh, we'll go from there. So, is there a second to Regent Rocha's motion? I would second. All right. Then, before any discussion, we're going to take a short uh, break until uh, five o'clock. Uh, I think that gives us eight minutes uh, to come back, and then we will discuss Regent Rocha's motion. Uh, just, yes. Regent Johnson had his hand his up. Hand. I'm sorry, <laughs> Regent Johnson. I didn't see that. Regent Tad Johnson, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, rather than discussing this uh, matter, the, the motion that Regent Rocha made, um, I, I think he's raised an interesting idea. However, I, I suggest we delay it. And so therefore I move to table uh, Regent Rocha's motion. Okay. So there is a second to table the motion by Regent Rocha. So point of order by our uh, Robert's rules. Um, is there is the motion to table a debatable motion? Well, anything can be. Looks like Jason is checking. It is not debatable, Madam Chair. Um, All right. Madam, point, um, point of order, Madam Chair. Before we do that, uh, not debatable, um, do you want to uh, explain, uh, Regent Tad Johnson, the basis of your motion to table Regent Rocha's motion? Yeah, I, I would. Um, I, I just need additional information on this uh, matter, which is legal. It's also very close to a personnel matter, and uh, we would. Uh, most likely be waiving attorney client privilege. 
And uh, I just think that at this point time, order, it's Madam Chair. If it's wait, wait, wait. No. Point of order. Yes. If it's non-debatable, this sounds like a debate in favor of or an opposition to Regent Rose's motion, which I, yeah, either we're it's non-debatable or we're going to have an open debate and suspend the rules. All right, I was asking for an explanation for the motion. I understand where the explanation may be viewed as debatable. Um, it's a non-debatable motion, so we will go ahead and- I, But I do have a point of order question, Madam Chair. Point of order, let's hear what do you think is a point of order. My motion. point of order on the well, the well orchestrated motion. Mr. Langworthy. Sorry. That, Mr. Lang, Mr. Langworthy. Um, a, a motion to table is not a substitute for a motion or, or simply defeating a motion. Is there a, what What are the circumstances under which it would be laid, be laid on the table until a certain time or what? It, what is the provision for, uh, because it's it's not to be used solely as a way of preventing a vote or defeating a motion. It would have to be until, it, uh, 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 until something that would trigger it to come back. What would that be in a circumstance like this? Uh, yes, Mr. Langworthy. Chair Mayor, on Regent Rocha, uh, typically the uh, motion to lay on the table means that the, uh, the body, in this case the board, would return to the motion later in the meeting, but to set it aside to uh, receive uh, advice or to move <coughs> on to something else. Uh, a motion to postpone or to postpone indefinitely uh, would be then to to move the motion from this uh, from this meeting. So I think if if uh, the chair could certainly uh, ask uh, Regent Johnson uh, for clarification on what the intent of the motion uh, is. All right. That's my understanding that would, it's a postponement intent, not tabling intent, because we're right. so, leaving the meeting. So uh, Regent Tad Johnson, can you clarify, are you bringing a motion to table, which would mean we would discuss it in a bit, or are you bringing a motion no, to No, I um, just want to correct that. I want a motion to, uh, Postpone it indefinitely. Postpone indefinitely. All right. And is there a second to that motion? Second. And that is not a debatable motion. Is it, am I correct, uh, Mr. Langworthy? I'm double checking. Pardon? You're checking. Double checking. All right. Just checking. It is debatable, Madam Chair. It's a debatable motion. All right. Then uh, with that, then uh, Regent Johnson, do you want to um, share with us the basis for this? Uh, you were starting to, um, and then we got into an appropriate dialogue on what kind of motion this was. So why don't you go ahead and then we'll let others weigh in. Yes, I know there's been a great deal written uh, and pursuant to uh, attorney client privilege and um, I don't think this is the type of matter that should be discussed um, since it's so close to a personnel matter um, openly because uh, just uh, it, it uh, uh, it's not something that uh, is uh, should be subject to uh, uh, public, th th there would be a lot of information that would be flying that is, um, uh, that, that, you know, is, is personnel matter. And, and I don't think that, uh, uh, we want to do that. So consequently, um, I understand what Regent Rocha wants to do is hire a third party attorney. And, um, uh, I don't know that, um, some of us have reviewed, um, enough of the materials to to make that kind of conclusion. And uh, my understanding is this is a rather, uh, I know we hire outside counsel, but I don't know that this is a, uh, a particular point where we would like to do that. All right, thank you very much. Uh, other uh, individuals who wish to speak to the motion to postpone Regent Rocha's motion indefinitely. Yes, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayor. Lots of parliamentary procedure today. Um, 
you know, my thing is just, again, speaking generally, as this Regent Tad Johnson has said, um, my um, standing, you know, all along on, on this issue, but then the variety of issues that accompany, accompany it, is I would just like the, you know, I'm supportive of the appropriate venue of the, or the board having the appropriate venue um, to discuss it, understanding certainly that there are um, some sensitivities involved. And so, um, you know, I am, I am, I respect only, you know, Regent, I only speak to Regent Tad Johnson because he's the only one that's spoken yet, but I, I hear him on wanting to have a little bit more time to um, review the materials. Um, and so I'm, I'm fine with that for today, but I do really believe that, you know, I want to have a discussion as a board about these particulars and whatever the appropriate way is to do that. Um, and so I've, I've been saying that for a while and, and continue to support that um, because I think that cleans up what I would describe as the other half of of these outstanding transition related issues, which you know I've, I've talked to you about, Chair Mayron and whatnot. So, um, getting a little particular here, fine with the motion to postpone, but I do, you know, want a commitment to which I would hope we have that the board can do some cleanup um, on these issues in um, the appropriate manner. All right, so. uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair, Regent Johnson. Um, I have a question that not quite sure who it's to, but you know, um, we've gotten a bit of guidance over the years, right, on on open meeting law, which we obviously want to respect. And um, I think there's been a lot of considerations of uh, what we can't discuss privately. I guess my question then is, Regent Tad Johnson alluded to some things we can't discuss publicly. And I would I would imagine something falls in one or the other. So if we if we can't discuss it in this setting, I would be led to believe that that is something we could discuss in closed session. Maybe, but then again, maybe that's too logical for the for the for the law in question. I don't know where I can get some clarification on that. This may be something that um, I see that the general counsel's office is here, uh, General Counsel Peterson. Um, and maybe this is something for you to come up here and, and try to answer uh, the question of Region Kenyanya. Chairman, Mayor, and, um, Regent Kenyanya, let me um, try to respond to this um, while simultaneously honoring my professional responsibilities with regard to the privilege. Um, and this is the attorney-client privilege. The attorney-client privilege. Um, there are a number of legal questions that are yet to come with regard to the personnel issue you're, you're talking about that is related to the transition. I do believe that there are a number of dimensions that are going to play out that where you need good legal advice. That's a chapter that, you know, is yet to come. And so on this question of outside counsel, we regularly address that and we have addressed that in a number of contexts where we've decided that for various reasons, there's a need for additional counsel. There's a need for sometimes um, independent counsel. Um, and those are very fair questions. And all of you are ultimately the client that sort of makes that decision. But my counsel to you is that you should get information um, about that um, privileged question. And then you should decide as a board of regents as to how to address that and who you want sort of you know, working that through vis-a-vis -vis sort of the president. And you're not there yet. Um, there have been sort of communications thus far in terms of kind of where you've been to date, but what you're talking about now is something that um, you're just embarking on in a conversation today about what her various responsibilities are. There are gonna be further conversations on some of the contract issues that are connected with um, her departure from the university. Those contract issues are going to have a number of choices to them. I do think you um, 
need good legal advice for that. It's an advice you have not yet received um, in total. And I think, you know, arm in arm with you, arm in arm with the full board, arm in arm with um, uh, new board leadership, um, that's something that, you know, we should kind of think through and ultimately it's your decision as a client. But um, I strongly urge you to um, wait until you're well informed before you make that choice. And uh, we can kind of do that and in whatever vein the board prefers. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, General Counsel. The uh, advice was helpful. I um, don't know that it got to my question. I was specifically asking about the open meeting law and our the question, the discussions you alluded to, our ability to have them and you know what venue we can we can have those in. Um, so, in relating to personnel matters, um, I'm getting the sense, and it, it would make sense to me that we can't discuss some of that openly. W would I then be correct in in understanding that then that is a situation where we can have a, a, a closed meeting? Regent Kenyanya, there are various kind of circumstances um, that would kind of lead to sort of a conclusion that you'd want to make with regard to the question you've asked. As a general matter, you have the ability as a board to discuss in an open meeting what you wish. It's more just the, you know, it's one, a constraint of the DPA in terms of private personnel data. That's a hard limitation. The privilege issue is a choice you have but just know that um, the privilege is one of those privileges where once you waive it in part, you waive it in its entirety. And so you have the ability as a board to make a board decision to waive the privilege in whole or in part. But once you make that decision as to one aspect of a subject matter, you're waiving it as to the entire matter, anything that's sort of covered by that privilege. So yes, you do have the ability to speak to open, speak to privileged issues in an open meeting, but you just need to appreciate the privilege, the waiver of the privilege implications of doing that. And that's where I'm, I, I say, I, um, in order for you to be sort of an informed client, you need more legal advice about all of that and it has to be matched up with the factual context in terms of how you'd like to step and when you'd like to step and you've you haven't received that yet final indulgence yeah, yeah. Um, I, so i are we and i understand it's maybe nuanced or complicated but are we able to have this discussion in a closed setting? No. I mean, as a, as a general matter, um, the, as to attorney-client privilege matters, the only area in which you can have a closed meeting is if there's litigation or threatened litigation. You don't have the ability to have a closed meeting to just discuss privileged issues. That's what your question is. And and from the employer personnel perspective? Uh, Regent Kenyanya, you know, with regard to, you know, President Gable, your policy set up a presidential performance review committee. And the way in which that committee proceeds to handle a number of these issues will need to be handled in a way that comports with the DPA and all of the private personnel data issues that surround it. And the, the sort of handling of those matters by the PPR is something that we've navigated before and we'll need to navigate again once you determine sort of the makeup of the PPR. And so it will be good for that PPR group to get advice on the very question you just asked. 
Thanks. It's complicated. <laughs> Suffice it to say. Regent uh, Rosha. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, so with respect to the motion in front of us to postpone indefinitely, um, I would speak against the motion uh, with, uh, in response to Regent Johnson's uh, statement for the basis for the motion. Um, this motion is not at all asking for an opportunity to talk about a personnel matter in a public setting. Uh, that's not, the motion is simply to uh, empower the board uh, with um, legal advice. Uh, I know that the general counsel made, made two comments uh, that I would like to highlight. One is he referenced um, advice that we have not yet received. Um, and, and then the second uh, comment was that he you know, urges us to be at a position where we are well informed. In my opinion, being well informed requires legal uh, counsel, it requires legal advice. And uh, we are now several weeks um, into this um, transitional environment and, and have not actually had the conversation that virtually any client I've ever had in a departure would have, have sought immediately upon notice that a key person is going to be leaving. And that is, what are the implications under the contract? What, are the, what, what do we want to do moving forward? How do we uh, address this? What are the cost implications of decisions that we make? Um, and uh, you, you know, one of the challenges that that uh, that I have raised in the past also is that you know our, our general counsel um, and our, our team does a, a remarkably wide range of things for this institution. It's a very, very important part of what we do, uh, but they also work directly with the president. In fact, in, in, in citing, I was reviewing case law where the president is a named party, the general counsel represents the president. And so I don't want to put the general counsel in a position uh, uh, whether you know in rules of conflict, but in the in the in the comparative uh, interests of the president and the board in having a conversation about how we want to proceed in the best interest for the university, um, and so uh, as as general counsel mentioned, we we bring in uh, outside counsel very frequently um, on matters, and this is a very clean uh, opportunity for us to do that, and so. Um, to the extent that we have a public that we represent and to the extent that we have some high profile issues that will be coming before us, I think that we are well advised uh, at this moment. In fact, I would love to turn the clock back a couple weeks, um, uh, uh, but we can't do that, obviously. But I would like I, I would like this board to be empowered with competent outside employment defense counsel to take a look at our um, our arrangement at this point and, and give us advice on what options we have. And if, if counsel comes back and um, determines that um, uh, that we are you know heading in a, a specific course, then uh, we are none the worse for wear. In fact, we have the strength of that representation on our side for uh, things moving forward. So um, I would I would ask that you uh, oppose the motion and approve the uh, original motion. Uh, Regent Halen. Reminding part everyone, the motion currently is a motion to postpone the original motion, which was to direct the office of the Board of Regents to retain outside counsel. This motion is a motion to postpone that motion indefinitely. Chair Mayron, in order to meaningfully respond to several of the comments that have been made, I would be veering very close to the attorney-client privilege in order to meaningfully respond to some of them, and I'm not comfortable doing that. I, I would really respectfully request that we call the question on this, on Regent Johnson's motion. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, with a uh, request to call the question, um, Procedurally, does that, uh, I, do I act on that at this point? Not debatable. Yes, not debatable. All right. We're going to call the question. All those uh, in favor of postponing no, the. No, Madam Chair, it's pending debate is calling the question. Pardon? You first vote to end the debate and then you vote on the motion. Ah, I'm being educated right and left. All right. <laughs> so, uh, first, so the first item is to end the debate. Is that if, what it, if, if Regent Perhalen's comment is to be taken as a motion and Regent Ruth Johnson's second is to be taken as a, as a second <laughs> yes. by U.S. Chair, then the appropriate uh, next step is to vote to end debate. All right. And then you go to the motion that's on the table. Ah. 
On Thank you very much. On the, on the All floor. right. That's right. Sure. All right. <laughs> Let me clarify, Regent uh, Verhalen, was that a motion to call the question? Sure. All right. And Regent uh, Ruth Johnson, was that a second? Yes, it was. All right. All those in favor of calling the question and ending debate, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No. We have three no's and uh, the motion carries. The next motion is the motion to indefinitely postpone the motion by Regent Rocha. All those in favor of the motion to indefinitely postpone Madam that Chair, motion. And may I request a roll call, please? We will do a roll call. So we're doing a roll call. Uh, go ahead, Executive Director Seeks. On the motion to indefinitely postpone the Rocha motion, Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Farnsworth. No. Regent Farnsworth votes no. Regent Hipsch. Yes. Regent Hipsch votes yes. Regent Ruth Johnson. Yes. Regent Ruth Johnson votes yes. Regent Tad Johnson. Yes. Regent Tad Johnson votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Powell. Yes. Regent Powell votes yes. Regent Rocha. No. Regent Rocha votes no. Regent Swigum. No. Regent Swigum votes no. Regent Talirabe. Yes. Regent Talirabe votes yes. Regent Verhalen. Yes. Regent Verhalen votes yes. Chair Mayron. Yes. Chair Mayron votes yes. The motion carries nine to three. And the motion, uh, Regent Rocha's motion is uh, postponed indefinitely. We're going to take a short uh, restroom break now, and we will come <laughs> back at uh, 525. Thank you very much.
We are back at the uh, special meeting. Uh, before we entertained uh, the motion made by Regent Rocha, uh, we had gone through six items where um, to get your sense of whether uh, President Cable should be engaging in the activities that I recommended that she be engaged in. Um, and the balance of that was that I was further recommending that the Remaining open issues and projects, which she identified on her April 11 memo, uh, either continue to advance elsewhere in the administration or shift from President Gable to where they are usually housed within the administration. So with that, I would like to consider the six recommendations that I made to you as a single action, as we do with a consent report. First, I will see if anyone would like to separate out an item to be considered before I invite a motion to approve the recommendations as I had presented them to you. Does anybody wish to separate out any of the six items of recommendation? Yes, Regent Parts. Uh, Chair Mayor, more procedurally, just to be clear, we're accepting the recommendations as you presented them with some of the amendments, stuff, informal amendments that we made during the conversation. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, Yes, so Regent Tarabi. Oh, oh, you were just. That was just me. <laughs> it is. Okay. Uh, <laughs> is there a motion to approve the recommendations as outlined in the docket materials? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion on the recommendations? All those in favor of aye, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. And with that, there, if there is no further discussion, this matter and this meeting is adjourned.